Hi everyone out there at home. Uh, welcome back to Wednesday evenings at Cambridge University Astronomy. Um, I am doubly happy today to be uh, introducing the evening. Uh, first of all, because we have an excellent speaker and an excellent talk lined up for you. But secondly, we have our first stargazing of the year. Um, it's taken us till the middle of November, but we have some clear skies. And so after the talk, we're going to be going over to the Cambridge Astronomical Association uh, to see what we can see. And I think they've got some nice galaxies and some lovely shots of the moon lined up. Uh, before that, I am delighted to introduce our headline speaker, Dr. Nina Sartorio, who's going to be telling us all about Stardust, which is very exciting. So over to you, Nina. Right. Thank you so much, Matt. OK, so I think all of you already heard the famous quote of we are all Stardust, right? Uh, and that's largely because we know that we are made out of elements, lots of metals, like things like iron in your blood or calcium in your bones, they all had to be made in stars somehow. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know about dust is the importance it has for astronomy. And that's what I'm gonna try to talk about a little bit today. So we start our story going back in time to 1785. Uh, and this guy here is uh, Herschel. And he was asking some really interesting questions like, I wonder how the stars are organized in the sky. And basically what he was asking is, what is the shape of the Milky Way? Though he didn't know that because at that time we didn't know that there were multiple galaxies. We just thought that, you know, there were stars and they were all concentrated around us um, in this local universe of ours. So what he did is that he started looking basically at a lot of directions and start mapping out the stars that he saw. And he basically said, well, I'm going to assume that all stars uh, that exist, I can see. And if I can't see any stars anymore, then it must mean that the universe is over. That's the edge of the universe. Uh, so he made this picture, this lovely picture. So if you will, this is the very first picture of our Milky Way. And you can see that he put the sun in the middle, which we know is not true. The, the sun is actually about halfway out in the disk of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And it looks very weird, right? There's this lots of spikes. There is this very weird region here on the right-hand side. Um, and if you ever seen any illustration of what the Milky Way looks like, it looks nothing like this. So how come Herschel got it so wrong? Well, the reason why there is all the spikes here is because there were lots of regions of the night sky that he couldn't see any more stars in. In fact, he found even some regions that he couldn't see any stars in the middle of these blobs. So I'm gonna see, show one of them here now. So if you look at this one, you can just see this place in the, in the sky that you can see no stars. And his, Herschel famous, famously said, here truly is a hole in the heaven. So he thought that this was basically a place that you had just no stars. It was just a big hole in the heavens and that's it. And people were stuck with this idea for a very, very, very long time. Until in the beginning of the 1900s came this guy, that uh, Barnard, and he said, well, I'm not really buying this story that there just ain't any stars in this bit of the sky. He said, well, maybe instead of just being a hole, what we have is actually just a bunch of mush that is covering the stars. And there are stars behind it, but there is something blocking our view that we can't see. And it took another 30 years until Templar came along and he started looking at all these objects that Barnard took. So he, he made a huge catalog of these Barnard objects. And he started seeing that basically around these Barnard objects in general, you would have this really reddish stars. Can you see that the stars look more red? And all of them would kind of have this effect. So he discovered that this reddening was actually happening because of dust. Um, now, what do we mean by dust, right? You have a lot of dust in, well, hopefully not a lot of dust in your house, but uh, the dust that we see and we talk about in our day-to-day -day life is this dust that we can see. The dust in, in, 
in, in space is completely different. So let's give it a look. So these are two pictures of dust that we actually have um, recovered from space. And they are really, really, really small. And they are made usually of silicates or, or out of carbon material. And they are surrounded by this layer of ice. So usually it can be ice like just water ice, or it can be other types of ice, like ammonia ice or something else. Uh, and the reason why they have this ice is because in this Barnard clouds, where it's really, really lots of dust uh, compacted together, it's a really, really cold region of the universe. So those dust grains, they are usually about 10 Kelvin, which is, you know, minus 260 uh, degrees Celsius. It's really, 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 really cold. So they're in the coldest bits, bits of the universe. And they are really tiny. If we're to have an idea on how tiny they are, here is a picture of a, of a human hair. So you can see here that the hair is 10 micrometers. So if I take this top grain and I put next to the hair, this would be the size of the grain. They are really, really tiny. You wouldn't be able to see with your naked eye almost any, any dust grain that you see in outer space. Um, but they are really important because dust is really everywhere. If you are lucky enough to be in a place where it is very, very dark and you can see the night sky properly, you can see the Milky Way across the sky and you can see this really big dust cloud that is covering a lot of the stars. And for you to have an idea how much dust is out there, the the Earth actually, as it rotates around the sun, it picks up a lot of this dust that we find uh, in the space in between stars. And we actually gather about 10 tons a year of dust, of this really, really tiny dust. Imagine how many dust grains we need to, you know, accrete in order to sum up to 10 tons. It's a lot. And this is not just a picture of our Milky Way. Here we can see two other galaxies. So here we have Sen A and we have the Sombrero Galaxy. And what you can see is this big dust belt uh, around the galaxies kind of blocking a lot of the light, right? So you imagine that you have a galaxy that has tens of billions of stars and you having this dust around already is enough to block the light from all those stars, basically. And you think that maybe there is a lot of dust, but actually dust makes just one thousandth of all the matter, that we, the normal matter that we know that exists in the universe. So that's not including dark matter, but all the normal matter that we know of, the baryonic matter, just a tiny, tiny percentage is this dust that's scattered around everywhere in all the galaxies. Okay? And what is crazy is that about 50% of all the light that is made by stars is actually blocked by dust. So 50% of all the light that you can uh, see or potentially see would be blocked by dust and is modified by dust. So what happens to the light that reaches this dust? Does it just disappear? Well, it can't just disappear. So what happens? So there are two main processes. The first one I'll be talking about is what we call scattering. So when you have a star, a star emits light in a number of frequencies. So you have uh, stars that are emitting things that are from X-rays all the way to things that are like microwaves. Um, okay, but or, or radio waves even. So there. And what the difference between these different types of light is what we call the wavelength. So there are some wavelengths that are larger, which, we, which are usually the red wavelengths. The more red something is, the, the bigger the wavelength. So these are things like red light, the infrared, the submillimeter. And then there are wavelengths that are shorter. Things like uh, blue light, UV light, and then if you go to x-rays and so on. Now, because these dust grains are really tiny, they are really good at, absor at absorbing and scattering these very, very small wavelengths. So it just kind of throws these wavelengths around. So if you imagine that you have a star here emitting at a shorter wavelength like blue, this blue light gets scattered around. 
But if you have a very long wavelength, this wavelength is, it, the, this light is just able to pass through this whole of this bunch of dust without being altered. So you can actually see it. And this may sound weird or maybe something that you don't know very well, but actually you experience it basically every day. So when you think about the sun and the sunset, the sun looks very, very red and the sky looks very red. And the reason for that is because the light has the light from, from the sun has to pass through a lot of atmosphere when it's in the horizons, the bit that it has to pass through most atmosphere and where the atmosphere is densest, closest to the earth. So all the blue light gets scattered and you just have the red light remaining. The same way you can think about the blue light that gets scattered is what gives rise to our blue sky. So when light from the sun comes and reaches our atmosphere, all the little particles in atmosphere scatter this blue light, which makes the sky seem blue. And exactly the same thing happens with lights from the stars when it passes through an interstellar dust cloud. So the red light is allowed or the long wavelengths are allowed to pass through, whereas the short, shorter shorter wavelengths, they are just scattered around. So what happens? Well, then we can just go back to this Barnard cloud and try looking at things from another angle or even better, another wavelength of light. So if you take the Barnard cloud and instead of looking in the visible light, we start looking at the infrared, then, a, then the whole cloud becomes transparent because all this red light is able to reach us now. And we discovered that behind this one cloud, we had over 3,000 stars hidden. And all the stars, because they are, they just the red light can pass, if you just take a photo of those stars on each frequency, they will look redder than they are in reality. Okay, but then what happens if I'm not looking, you know, at this direction? What if the observer is actually seeing some of this blue light that gets scattered? Well, that also happens. Those are what we call reflection uh, nebulas. So here we have uh, the witch hat nebula. I think this is fantastic. Look, you can see her nose and her really big chin. Um, and it's it's completely blue and not because it is emitting blue light, but because it has stars like this one close by that emit light. And then the, this nebula is able to scatter uh, some of this blue light towards us so that we can actually see that there is dust there. Um, and maybe something that's more familiar to you, if you know the Pleiades, they also uh, suffer from from this scattering of blue light and they actually look bluer than they would otherwise. So those are the, the ways that you can actually see this dust is either by it scattering or by it um, completely blocking light uh, from stars. Now, this is not the only way that dust can interact with, uh, with light. So dust is also very, very efficient at absorbing uh, low frequency, uh, low wavelength light. So if you have, for example, ultraviolet light coming from the stars, this, this dust can absorb the UV and it can start heating up. And it heats up and it doesn't heat, much, heat up a lot, but it heats up to start emitting light, thermally emitting light in the infrared. So all this dust can glow a little bit in the infrared. Um, so one good idea would be to go to this very, very specific wavelength in which dust is glowing and try to look at the universe. And actually there's another thing that glows in the infrared, that's you. Yes, because we also have a temperature, thankfully, a lot higher than the dust, but not so high as, for example, the sun. We also glow in, in a wavelength that's not so far off which is also um, in, in the infrared. So if you take an infrared camera, you can actually see yourself and lo and behold, it also works. For example, if you cover your hands with a bin, bin bag, then you can see uh, through the bin bag in the infrared because the, the bin bag is not at the same temperature as your body. 
Okay. So let's give a look on how we can we can use this glowing dust to increase our knowledge of the universe. So here's a picture of the Andromeda galaxy in the visible light. And you can already maybe have a little clue of where the dust is hiding. Can you see this dark patches here and here and here? It could seem that those are just holes for the galaxy. But then if you just go and look in the infrared, you see this amazing picture that was taken by the Herschel telescope uh, that just shows all the dust glowing around. And if you actually superpose the two pictures, you can see that the dust lies exactly where you had those dark lines um, in the galaxy. So actually there is no real empty space in, in galaxies. Most of the this the space between stars or the interstellar space is completely filled with dust and gas. Okay, so here's a, another one just for fun. So here you can see the Rupo uh, galaxy, and you can see the, the visible light here on the left and the infrared here on the right. And you can see how the infrared seems to be kind of the reverse. Everything that was dark in the, in the visible light now becomes bright and vice versa. So you can find all this dust um, in this, this spiral arms here. Okay, so just as a recap, so depending on which, which light you look, which wavelength you look the universe in, the universe is gonna look completely different. So if you look, at, so this is the horse red nebula, which you might have heard of. And here you can see it in the visible. And here, what you have is a forming star. And then you can look at it in the near infrared. So this is, this is that frequency in which all the light can pass through the nebula. It doesn't get blocked like in the, in the, visible, like the visible light. So everything becomes transparent. So you can start seeing all the stars. So here you can see these two stars that are also here, but they're much brighter here. Uh, and you can also see that you missed a lot of stars if you were just looking in the visible light. And then if you go towards even uh, longer frequency, longer wavelengths, then what you can find is that the dust is just glowing in this mid infrared and you can see um, basically the structure of this dust cloud that's lying around. Now, it's also very important to notice that actually most of the stars, actually all of the stars, are formed into this really, 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 really dust regions because dust it just helps to cool the gas uh, and it helps the gas compact into what one day is gonna form stars. So if you look at any big stellar star formation region, so those um, molecular clouds, they are all gonna be very, very, very filled with dust. So dust is essential to make stars. And that also poses a little bit of a problem because it means that if we wanna see stars forming, we also have to see through all this dust. So there is a general feeling in astronomy, especially at the beginning, that we don't like dust very much. Because, well, dust makes some things look bluer, makes some things look redder. It also makes a lot of stars look a lot dimmer or even disappear completely, as we just saw. So this poses a huge uh, challenge because it means that everything that you're seeing with your, with your naked eye or even with a telescope is not actually the object itself. It's the object's light that has been reprocessed by dust. So before we can actually start discovering what the universe has on offer, we need to understand the dust. We need to understand the dust to understand the rest of the universe. Okay? So with that spirit in mind, um, we try to make big telescopes. Now, there is a little bit of a problem when we are talking about dust is that, as we just saw, the most interesting wavelength to look at dust is in the infrared. The problem is that if you are here bound to Earth, as we are, um, the, the infrared is just one of those um, wavelengths that gets mostly absorbed by Earth's atmosphere. 
Uh, so the atmosphere is very good for protecting us from really damaging radiation, but sometimes it's just very annoying that we can't look at the bits of the sky that we want to see. Um, there is also another problem that the Earth itself is kind of like a giant dust grain. So it also emits in the infrared, which doesn't help with observations either. Um, so in order for us to get a good picture of the universe, we can either send a telescope to space so that it doesn't you know, have all this problem of the Earth emitting in the infrared, um, it doesn't have all this problem of the atmosphere, or we can make just a very humongously big telescope here on Earth. And because we like the idea of looking at the universe in the infrared, we did both. Uh, so here's a couple of examples that I think revolutionize our understanding of the universe and our understanding of dust. Uh, here on our left, I'm showing the, the Herschel telescope. So for you to have an idea of its size, I put like a picture when it was still on Earth um, here on the bottom. And obviously we sent the Herschel to space and Herschel was able to take a lot of very interesting images in the infrared. Uh, and here on my right, uh, we have ALMA. And ALMA is a different type of telescope than you might be accustomed with. It's what we call an interferometer. So we take just basically a bunch of uh, dishes. So you can see here, you have lots and lots and lots of dishes. And each one of them picture, pick, picks up an image. And then we can combine all of this to actually get an image that would be as good as if you had um, a much, much bigger telescope that spans the distance between uh, two, the two furthest away uh, of, the, of these dishes. So you can actually use ALMA to make what would be, if it were a single dish, a telescope that is basically the size of the city of Edinburgh. So a really, really, really big telescope. So, both Alma and Herschel, they were able to give us pictures of the universe in the infrared that we just couldn't before. Uh, so we've been looking at the universe with our indivisible light for 400 years, but really we've only been able to really appreciate the infrared universe for you know the last decade. Um, so one of the really one of the examples of the really cool science that we can do now, for example, with Alma is we can see for the very first time the stars forming that I was talking about. So here on the left, you can see the formation of a, of a binary system. So those are two stars that are forming together and they kind of rotate around each other. So the sun doesn't have a companion star, but actually most of the stars in the universe have a companion star. They are in a binary system. And we never really knew how the matter around the stars behaved. And now thanks to Alma, we can first finally see that. Uh, and then here on the right, we have this very famous picture of H.L. Tauri, in which you can not only see this uh, star forming at the center of the image, but you can also see this beautiful disk um, that is around the forming star that's gonna form the planets uh, one day. So you can even see this, this dark lines where you can have uh, material that um, is just disappeared. And it's a critique. Anyway. Um, and with Herschel, we've been able to take pictures such as this one. So this is the Herschel code dust map. Um, each, it might not seem very impressive, but each point in this image is a whole entire galaxy full of dust. And actually some of those galaxies are incredibly far away. They are galaxies that came from the very beginning of the universe. They are billions of years old. Um, and then the problem is that we must have had a lot more, we have a lot more dust than we ever thought we could have. And this posed a very big problem to the origins of the dust because up to, you know, 2010, 2011, we thought that a lot of dust was produced in stars very much like the sun. So here's an example um, of, of what the, of a red, super red giant. So this is a star called Betelgeuse. Uh, the sun is not gonna quite become the same thing, it's gonna become a red giant. Uh, 
but this is a star that already evolved for most of its lifetime. And now it kind of blew up to be something so as big, like if you put the Betelgeuse where the sun is, it would be, you know, up to the orbit of Jupiter or so. And it's kind of throwing this material around. You can see this orange and this green thing is just throwing this dust and all this uh, metals out there. And we thought that by doing that, by this blowing up and then throwing some of this material back into the universe, that's how you actually made the dust grains. Uh, but there is a little bit of a problem. The first problem is that these stars, they take too long to form. These super red giants and red giants, they are stars that already evolved for most of their lifetime. They already stopped burning hydrogen in their core and they started burning something else. They started burning helium. And the other thing is that if we look at these stars today, they don't seem to be producing enough dust to explain all the dust that we observed with Herschel. So if for you to have a star like this producing a tiny amount of, of dust and taking so long to do this, these stars take, stars like the sun, for example, will take 10 billion years before they start producing substantial amounts of dust, then that can't explain those galaxies very, very, very far away from the beginning of the universe that already had a lot of dust. Um, and we were very confused because we were like, well, if you want to form dust, then you probably need a place that has lots of metals and is very cold. Because if you're not very cold, then you probably can't form dust very effectively, right? Well, not quite. So at one beautiful day, we decided to actually look at supernova explosions. So the supernova explosions is just the end of a, of a very massive star's uh, lifetime. It just explodes and it throws all the metals that it made throughout its lifetime into space, right? But this, the supernova explosions, they're incredibly energetic and they heat up everything around them to, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of, of, of degrees. Um, so, how, how, so we never expected to find dust in those regions. But if we looked at them, and this is one example that's very interesting. So this is uh, supernova 1987A. Eh? And this is a supernova that many of you could have potentially seen. So it actually exploded in 1987 in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And if we look today with it in Alma, ta-da, you can see all this red dust glowing in there. And actually we measured how much dust is in there and is dust enough to make 200,000 Earths. So it's a ginormous amount of dust that was able to form you know, in a very, very small amount of time, just 35 years. Uh, but it still remains a huge mystery on how the supernova explosions can actually create so much dust. And there's a lot of debate still if all the supernovas produce so much dust. So there's still a lot to understand, which is good news. Uh, and we are having new telescopes that we are sending out to space that hopefully are gonna help us look at many, many other supernova, some that are not so close to us. Uh, and try to explain on how exactly this dust is being formed in supernova. Uh, so one thing to look for is the J James Webb Space Telescope, telescope the J JWST. And heads up, it's launching in December, hopefully, and hopefully everything is also going to run smoothly. And if that does happen, then we're going to be able to also look at the infrared very, very well with this telescope and maybe explain a lot of the open questions that we have. Uh, so keep tuned uh, to figure out where the dust that led to us is made. Um, and that's it. Um, thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Nina. That's It's so fascinating to see this other side of the universe that you can see when you step into the infrared. Um, any questions for our speaker, if you pop them down there in the YouTube chat, um, I will get them to her. Um, 
as well as when, when you were showing those beautiful Alma images of those um the, those um circumstellar disks forming planets, I was wondering, did you see there was an a press release a few months ago, I think, where they found the first moon forming disk? Uh, oh, so really? It a, no. Yes, it was this beautiful image. So it's a a circumstellar. It was a, a protostar surrounded by a stellar disk, and you could see the little planet. But surrounding the planet was this little halo of fuzz, and it was a a, a tiny little ring forming a moon. It was kind of lovely. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Um, I was wondering um, if, uh, while people are thinking about questions, could you talk maybe a tiny bit more about the about James Webb uh, and maybe uh, the light it might shed on, uh, I don't know if your research might be impacted at all uh, about James Webb or uh, just some of, the, some of the exciting science that we might expect. I think everybody's science is going to be a bit impacted by JWST. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting because the J- JWST, it has a very good infrared, not only because... It wants to look at, for example, the things that I've been talking here, but also because a lot of we want to see basically the very, very first galaxies that formed, uh, the very stru- the very first structures that formed, and even the light that was then emitted as you know visible light or other types of light, as the universe expanded, that light also got stretched. So a lot of this very interesting, very you know, old galaxies, the very first stars that, you know, formed in the universe, they are now going to be shining, you know, their stretched wavelength actually lies in the infrared. So you are just going to be able not only to see a lot better some of the phenomena of, you know, the current universe, but also understand the early universe a lot better than we do right now. I think that's very exciting. It is very exciting. 18th of December, um, around lunchtime is the time. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers very hard. Yeah, <laughs> it was uh, a lot of wait already for the... Yeah, yeah it's yeah, it's been a long time coming, right? Uh, there's a question from Paul. Um, he wants to know, uh, what fraction of a galaxy's mass is dust on average? So it's actually a very tidy amount. I mean, if you if you exclude, for example, dark matter, which makes by far, you know, the most amount of matter we have in the universe, if you just consider normal matter, which we call baryonic matter, so the things that we can see, uh, then it's about a thousandth of of all the matter. So it's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. Um, Edita wants to know, and how do we calculate the amount of dust when it's so far away? How can we weigh something that's uh, potentially millions of light years away? It's a very good question. It's it's very hard to figure out how much dust exists almost anywhere. I mean, the errors we have in general are very large. Uh, we are able to see, um, for example, some of the light, it gets altered by dust. So, And we know how the object, for example, would look like without the dust in there. So it can account for that, take that reddening from the dust out. Uh, The other thing is that dust in itself, it helps uh, do kind of change the way that light is shined. So it it can polarize light in such a way that you, you know, it changes, it change like you you get light that is just I think the, the easiest way or the simplest you could spin is that it's only oscillating in one direction. You're not having like a modeled up light. Um, and usually what we do is we try to say that you have certain fixed ratios of things like gas to dust. And then you can estimate depending, for example, on the amount of dust, the amount of gas and vice versa. Um, wonderful, thank you. And so thank you uh, so much, Nina, for that absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I w- I'm hoping the sky is still clear. Maybe we can go over to the observers and uh, do a bit of stargazing. How's thank it looking, you. Brian? Okay. Well, well, we've got a little bit of high cloud, but we'll, we'll do our best. And we'll start off with David in, uh, in Barton and join him and see how, he, how he's going on. Hello. How's it, how's it looking? It's fine. That's good. And just above uh, our heads is the constellation of Perseus. And 
David's found a, a galaxy. It's not as uh, crisp as it should be because that's the high level cloud filtering out the, the, uh, some of the image. But we can see that that's a, a spiral galaxy edge on more or less. It's very similar to our, our galaxy, uh, same, same size, but it does have one peculiar feature. All galaxies tend to rotate the same way as the nucleus. But this one, the spiral arms are rotating in the opposite direction to the nucleus. And so this is, uh, uh, makes it a rather unusual galaxy. And it's just simply because it's been involved with a collision with a smaller galaxy that's produced this uh, 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 remarkable effect. And we can't quite see, but there should be some nearby other, some other galaxies nearby. Um, David's one pointing there. one there. There should one be there. There's one there. Yeah. yeah, that's it. There's one there. There's a little group of three there. There's one there. Yeah. There's a little, very faint scattering of galaxies here. Yeah. Uh, there's one here. And in the bottom right-hand corner of this image, there's one here, yeah. is a, quite a famous group of galaxies. I go down and across. Is this Stefan's Quintet? We should see Stefan's Quintet. If I just bring up the black yeah, this background was bit. Ah, there we are. There we are. There we are, here. Yes, it's a cluster of five galaxies. There they are. One, two, three. There's one here. Four, yeah. five. And there's one here. Four, four of them are linked to each other, and the other one is just a, a line of sight job. Uh, so um, there, there's uh, uh, a good group of galaxies there. Galaxies often appear in, in groups or quite large clusters of many thousands. So despite the poor conditions, we've got a, a good smattering of galaxies in uh, Perseus. But the galaxy we're looking at, this one, is by far the biggest and can be seen in a modest sized telescope. Um, oh, just the background. Yeah, try, trying, to, trying to deal with the cloud. But... That's good, and there, there are there are there's spiral galaxies and uh, uh, elliptical galaxies in this group. Okay, thank you, David, and we'll now head over to Swaffham Prior and see how Mick's getting on. Hang on, let me just share the screen. Okay. Oh, we've got the moon. Yay. Yep. And you can see the dark areas. The moon is very nearly full. And the top dark area at the, on the right is the Sea of Crises. And uh, it's, it's uh, fairly big. It's you can see the moon wobbling about a bit. We'll leave it small. Uh, you could just about squeeze England and Wales in inside that dark area. And these dark areas are you, the bits you, when you look at the moon with your naked eye, you can see the face of the man in the moon. And these dark seas, as they're called, are just huge impact basins that uh, occurred uh, about four billion years ago, when uh, the, there was lots of large asteroids uh, left over from the formation of the solar system, uh, drifting around the inner solar system and hitting the inner planets. And of course, uh, the moon got hit. But it, it's the, 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 after the impact, these um, filled with lava 
and that's why it looks dark. And then we can just see to one side of there, that's the crater Proclus. It's very bright. Um, it's not quite in focus, I think, because of, is it the cloud that's giving you grief? Yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, that's <laughs> a very bright crater because it's young. And we can see the, are you, are you trying to focus it a bit? Yeah, it's, I don't think it's going to improve. It's not not how happening, is it? No, we've got a bit of cloud going over. Yeah, we're, we're, don't worry. We we can see that the, this crater, when it was uh, formed, the stuff that came out from the impact only forms around three sides. You can see it's taken this butterfly shape, and that means that the asteroid that hit it came in from an angle. So from the bottom left, the asteroid came in and uh, sent the uh, ejector in the other three directions, as it were. And it must have come in at a very low angle. When you see the ejector round the uh, crater and it's a butterfly sh shape, you know that the uh, asteroid came in at about 10 degrees from the horizontal so it came in at a very low angle and then just moving uh, to the left a bit we've got three other seas the sea of serenity at the top the sea of tranquility and the sea of fertility the smaller one and so the Sea of Tranquility was chosen in 1969 for the astronauts to land. And you can always find where the astronauts landed because there's a little bright cr crater. Just, no, just carry, go to the right, uh, left again. That one there, that's it. That is not very far away from the landing site of the Apollo 11. And that obviously they chose a sea because the, the uh, surface is considerably flat, flat uh, than the, the lighter regions of the moon. So the dark regions are the seas, and the light areas of the moon you see um, are the highland areas. And so that's why they chose a sea to land in, first of all. Now, as we move across, we you can see two other craters coming into view. The one in the middle is Copernicus, named, and the other one to the left of it is uh, Kepler, after two uh, historic astronomers. And again, you see the Kepler ejector is a bit butterfly-shaped, meaning that the asteroid that formed that crater um, certainly came in at about 10 or maybe 15 degrees. But the pattern around Copernicus is perfectly circular. And so this is uh, a good uh, uh, an impact from more or less directly above. And no matter where, what angle an asteroid hits the moon, it always makes a round crater with one or two exceptions, which we'll see later. And then, as we see in the top left corner, there is a bright crater, and that's Aristarchus. And that's um, on a plateau, a square plateau, which is a volcanic region of the moon. It was active about a billion years ago compared to the rest of the volcanic activity, which occurred between three and four billion years ago. So this is quite a late area. And Aristarchus is just a crater on this plateau. This plateau is uh, about a couple of hundred uh, kilometers by a couple of hundred kilometers. And then we can see the Terminator, the moon quite isn't quite full and this is the you can see some of the craters in relief as one up there near the top 
when you look at the full moon, you don't see any relief. That's why it's always best to look at the moon when it's a phase. What uh, a full moon shows is usually the ray systems or the ejector patterns of the craters. But if you want to see the craters themselves, head towards the terminator. This is the boundary between the dark and the light. If you go down, see if we can see any more craters. Here we come. There's a, a one or two more. And we're starting to see some mountains as well. That's it, that's it. Because in a couple of days time, the moon will be full and these craters will just appear as faint dots. Then coming into view now is probably the most famous crater is Tycho. And this is easily visible in binoculars. And you can see the rays from it, the stuff that splashed out during the impact and it, they, they spread right round the face of the, uh, of the moon. And we can see it going a long way. And this is a fine sight in binoculars. Um, you can trace the rays going out. So as we carry on, we'll carry on going the other direction. Um, we should come to the uh, Sea of Fertility again. That's it. And then there are two craters together. Can you spot them? There we are. And this is the one on the right. They're only about 10 kilometers across. If I can, uh... As I say, the moon is, I mean, normally this would be very clear. I can see it, yeah. There, there we, we are. The one, they're only 10 kilometers across, so not very plain to see. But the one on the right is oval because the um, asteroid about half a kilometre across came in about two or three degrees above the horizontal. And it hit that, uh, hit the moon, made the first crater, then bounced 15 kilometres and made the second crater. And uh, the ejector only came out one side uh, for, and we can't quite see it again because of the cloud but we'll if it, the moon is around again we'll we'll have another look when there's no cloud about and this is a cracking sight okie doke we'll now carry on to jonathan who's in chesterton and see what he's managed to find how are the clouds there is making his life difficult yeah it's not too bad you asked me just to really show a photograph of the telescope i'm using brian yeah um this is this is a new gadget um it's actually called a selena and it's a robot camera telescope you can see the lens at the top there it's a, a an eight inch lens no, sorry 80 millimeter lens um and uh, the telescope is that bit on the top and it actually rotates back down into the body of the uh, telescope and inside the body, you've got a, uh, a 6.4 megapixel camera and a computer. And what the telescope does is takes the continuous stream of photographs and tries to put them all together uh, into a single image. And uh, I've had it aimed up at the, uh, the sky. And this is the image you wanted to get. This is uh, M15, Brian. OK, so this is all controlled from your mobile phone. It is all controlled by my mobile phone. So um, you're si sitting in the warm, not like the others, sitting out in right. the observatory, it's freezing. Yeah, yeah. You're, and you you're... can see that, 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 that's the phone app, and it's all ready to reset and, and point it at the Ring Nebula once we've finished talking to you. Okay, well, bring up the, uh, the globular cluster you were looking at. Yeah, it should be there. You see it? No, we've got your camera. You've got, you've got, got your telescope. Oh, still? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Get rid of it. That's it. I got rid of that. Apologies. No, 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 that's okay. I thought I'd move it to the other one. Is that better? That that's brilliant. Right, there are two sorts of clusters that we find in the Milky Way galaxy, and that's uh, globular clusters like this one that hover uh, around and orbit around the the Milky Way, and then. 
more conventional open clusters where stars have formed, they're loosely bound, and uh, over periods of hundreds of millions of years, these open clusters usually disperse. But the globular clusters are much, much bigger and last an incredibly long time. There are about 150 of these globular clusters, and the one we're looking at is about 12 billion years old and is one of the oldest. And it's also very densely packed. The globular cluster is about 175 light years in diameter, but it has a very compact core. Uh, m over half the stars are in a 10 light year uh, uh, area. And that means that the core has collapsed into a black hole. It's these core collapse uh, globular clusters are quite uh, rare. And these black holes are also rare. They're an intermediate black hole. They're about this one, the black hole at the center of this globular cluster is about 4,000 uh, masses, solar masses. So it's, it's, it's bigger than a stellar black hole, which range in size from uh, three to maybe a hundred solar masses. And then of course, the giant supermassive black holes that appear at the center of the galaxies. They can be hundreds of thousands of so so solar masses. But this is uh, uh, at the core of that uh, globular cluster is one of these rare intermediate uh, black holes. As I say, there's not many of them about. Okie doke, you were going to show us how, how you set this thing in motion. Yes. Um, and in fact, I've actually got this running on here now. It is currently trying to find, trying to get this without the reflections. It's very hard. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, the computer, the telescope is currently trying to get uh, set up on uh, M57. It's just gone to sleep altogether, hasn't it? Um, which is the ring nebula. I'm okay. trying to ang yeah, it's just better without just angled slightly. That's it trying to get its image. Um, uh, it'll settle down shortly uh, when all that condenses into a single circle. It might happen while we're watching it. It might take another minute or two. Looks like it's getting a bit busier. It might do. I'll just, just touch it to keep it bright. Um, and it should then decide it's going to start to take the photograph. It's a bit boring waiting for it to happen. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll come back to you if that's okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yep. yep. Okay. We'll go back to uh, David in Barton and see what, what he's found. Hello. Hiya. Let's have a look at this. All right. And this is uh, the Iris Nebula. And uh, it's very appropriate. We, we were talking, uh, Nina was talking about dust. And this is, this nebula is both dust and gas. Like many of the um, uh, gas clouds we see, like the Iran Nebula, we'll see later in the year when that rises. Um, they they uh, are excited by nearby stars and they shine and they em emit their own radiation. And so the Iran Nebula is a reflection nebula. However, this one is uh, a slightly uncommon a reflection nebula. And this is where a star, the star in the center of the gas cloud or the gas and dust cloud is shining on the dust and the dust is reflecting the light. So it's not, the, the, the gas is not being excited and emitting its own light. It's just purely a reflection. And that star is incredibly young. I talked about stars being um, a few hundred million years old, and we consider those uh, young. A star 10, 25 million years old is still in nappies as far as I'm concerned. But this star is the youngest star we know about. 
and it's just a few thousand years old, not millions, a few thousand years old. So I, I, I think this is more still in the delivery room as far as I'm concerned. And it's a, a very young star. Mostly we, we see younger stars in gas clouds, but they're considerably older than this. So this is a, a very rare sight. And this is known as the Iris Nebula. And uh, it's just purely the, being reflected by the dust. And as Nina said, the dust is uh, uh, 10 to 100 times finer, finer than the dust you find under your bed. OK, right. We're going to go back to Mick, see what uh, Mick has found. Um, OK, uh, I, all I've got is still the moon, unfortunately. All right. Not to worry. Uh, times are wagging. So we will go on to our last object and see if Jonathan has found M57. Yep, well, I can show you a couple of things. That first of all, I wanted to show you that's the the screen on the app, which is what I press to go and find things. You can yeah. see it says Ring Nebula M fifty seven, and if I then yeah. go to the next screen, this is what it's actually doing. And on that screen, you can see the tiny image in the middle. If I can get the reflections off the screen, um, Tilted there you go. Slightly, yeah, yeah, and you can see down the side. Uh, there's a number there is how many images it's taken so far. And up at the top, it tells you how much, how long the exposure is so far. So it's taking that image now. But uh, in good uh, Blue Peter style, I've got one I prepared earlier. So I'll just share my screen and show you what that image looks like um, when you uh, transfer it to your computer. So there's the Ring Nebula. This was taken just a few minutes ago. Uh, and I can make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, okay, please. It's it's not had as long an exposure as I'd like it to. It could do no, a little no. bit more. No, it that's all right. Uh, don't worry. I, I, I suspect the sky might light up a bit because of the high cloud. Yeah, the, uh, and the moon's uh, doing quite well as well. Yeah, yeah <laughs> give it a double whammy. Okay, yeah. so the Ring Nebula is what's left of a dwarf star similar to the sun that's come to the end of its life. When a star runs out of nuclear fuel, the smaller stars, they generally puff off the outer layers, which form uh, this, in this case, the nebula. And all that's left of the star is a very hot white dwarf at the center. Uh, I don't think we can quite see it. Yeah, it, it would be about there. Well, yeah, it? yeah. It's, yeah. Don't worry. We're, we're imagination. Once, yeah. Astronomy is 50% it, or imagination. It's, it's definitely there. You can see yeah. it really clearly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but again, if we, if we look next, next week when there's no cloud, uh, yeah. you'll be able to see it a lot better. But you can see the colours. You've got a, a red outside uh, ring. And uh, the whole uh, nebula is about a light year across. So it's would engulf our solar system many times over. And the, the, uh, the uh, outer ring the, is uh, formed by nit nitrogen and uh, sulfur. And then we've got an inner greenish ring that's uh, formed by oxygen that's uh, thrown out uh, from the dying star. And uh, the, the core... There's uh, lots of um, hydrogen being the last that's uh, puffed off. Uh, sorry, helium. The last uh, gas to be puffed off is the dark core. So this is uh, what will happen to the sun in about four and a half, five thousand uh, million years time. And we get a nice view of the stars around it. Okie doke. We're going to stop now because uh, the cloud is really giving us a hard time and we'll keep our fingers crossed for um, next week. But in the meantime, thanks to our uh, observers for persevering with some very difficult conditions. Okay, back to you, Matt. 
wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, I think quit while quit while you're ahead. Uh, yeah. is a good call. I know when I know when we're beaten. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jonathan. I, that's a very nifty piece of kit. Uh, I think that was very. It's very nice camera. I'm definitely going to be looking at one of those. Um, it's pretty remarkable. I can just do all that stacking in real time mm. from the comfort of your living room. Well, you're very welcome to come have a look at it sometime. <laughs> Right. Uh, so, yeah, thank you all to our observers. Thank you uh, to Dr. Nina Sartorio, who gave us a wonderful talk. Uh, we do these uh, evenings every Wednesday during the winter, and we'll, we will be back next week at 7.15. See you then. Doosh.